We read in the scriptures this morning as we find it in Isaiah 44. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 44. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring and they shall spring up as among the grass as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know, that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god or a molten image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth with it with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule, he marketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with the compass, and marketh and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He heweth him down cedars, taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn. For he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth meat, he roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Ha ha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even a graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, 
I have burnt part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith to Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So far we read, from God's Word. If you could put yourself with the captives in Babylon, many of them being born there, establishing homes, jobs and occupations, and having absolutely no hope that there would be any possibility of return to Jerusalem after knowing that it was utterly destroyed and the temple burned and the gates charred. And then to hear God say this, and you're under Babylon, and Cyrus is over Persia, and then to see suddenly the, the taking of that giant city of Babylon by the Persians. And Cyrus is its king. But the basis of the assurance that God would use Cyrus is what you find in verses 6 and 8. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And then at the end of 8, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. The knowledge of that God. Heidelberg Catechism, in the last two questions and answers of Lord's Day 34, put it this way. What doth God enjoin in the first commandment? That I, as sincerely as I desire the salvation of my own soul, avoid and flee from all idolatry, sorcery, soothsaying, superstition, 
invocation of saints and other creatures and learn rightly to know the only true God. Know Him? Trust in Him alone. With humility and patience, submit to Him. Expect all good things from Him only. Love, fear, and glorify Him with my whole heart, so that I renounce and forsake all creatures, rather than commit even the least thing contrary to His will. That's what he enjoins. That's what he requires. What is idolatry? Idolatry is instead of or beside that one true God who has manifested himself in his word to contrive or have any other object in which men place their trust. As much as I desire the salvation of my soul, we are very easily busy in all kinds of things of this earth. We know, sitting here on a Sunday, that we are supposed to desire the salvation of our soul more than anything. So nobody's going to say they don't. And yet, what are all the things that we did just take yesterday? And how about this morning? When we decided what we were going to wear. Where were we? Focused on His worthiness? As much as we desire the salvation of our soul? So even before we start, we're going to do it this way. This is the second time in the Catechism that we have the law presented. The first time is right away on the very first page. What are the three things that are necessary in order to enjoy this only comfort, to live and die happily? I must know my sin. Then I must know that I'm delivered and then I must know how to thank Him. How do you know how sinful you are? Out of the law of God. So there's no way that we can't consider the truth of this first commandment or any of the other nine without rightly being pricked. And pricked hard. But the wording of every one of the command, of the questions about the meaning of the commandments as it treats the catechism in detail is not, how have you failed? But rather, you have a Father, an Almighty God, that in His boundless mercy has been pleased to save you unto Himself. He's provided the way of forgiveness in His Son. And now we're at this point. How do we rightly thank Him? And that's how we're going to consider it. One other thought by way of introduction. The commandments that determine our, to identify sin... And the commandments, same commandments that are going to identify for us how we are to thank Him, how we are to praise Him.
how we are to show our gratitude. Those commandments aren't some things that God rather sat down and said, okay, what do I want to require? But they're really this, and this is a very human way to say it, so forgive all the weaknesses of that. It's that God looked inside himself, In every one of the ten, he looked inside himself and he reflected himself. No other gods. Because I alone am God. There is none beside me. That's why the first, to identify sin, but also to show thanks. There is no other one. I am God and I am God alone. And that's how we want to look. Sure, pricked. That's why we're here. But we want to learn how to thank Him. Now, wait a minute. We want to learn how to thank Him His way. We want to know how to love Him His way. Not our way, because then you'd have 360-some ways. We'd each have a preference. No, we're not. We so love Him that we don't want to show it our way. We want to show it His way. We're so thankful for what He's done for us in being pleased to blot out like a thick cloud our transgressions and as a cloud our sins. That He would redeem us. That now we want to thank Him His way. And He says, Flee! Run! From idolatry. Learn, and here's what we deal with in our first point. Learn rightly to know the only true God. Learn rightly to know the only true God. How can I know God? God is. And the infinite nature of that God makes my and our ability to know Him impossible. Psalm 115, verse 3 says, He is unsearchable. In Job chapter 11, listen to this. Canst thou, this is verse 7, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Now, now th think of these. They didn't have airplanes. They couldn't go to 30,000, 40,000 feet. They didn't have satellites that could go to the moon or to Mars. Canst thou find out the Almighty? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than the grave. What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up and gathered together, then who can hinder him? Zophar, friend of Job, spoke those words. Accurately. So the first thing that we're going to say about this God that is by the, His grace our God is this. He is beyond definition. As we strive to come to an understanding of Him, we start, and this may seem to the world to be ridiculous, but we're going to start with this. He's beyond definition. I will not ever be able to get him. Consider 
everything about him. I will not be able to comprehend him. He's God. Second, God is spirit. Not is a spirit. He is spirit. Jesus said that to the Samaritan woman when she said, Can, can't, can't we worship here in, in our mountain? Why do we have to go to Jerusalem and to Mount Zion? And Jesus, in response to her, said, Neither one really matter because God is spirit. And to say that means He being pure spirit is Invisible, invisible, John 1.18 and Colossians 1.15. But also, it means that God, with the whole of His being, is everywhere. He doesn't spread Himself out thinly, so that He's everywhere. With the whole of His being, He is everywhere. That's what's called, theologically, His eminence. That's the horribleness of some of our sins. We're in the back seat of a car. We're in our room with our iPad or smartphone. No other human. We're lying in bed, and we don't need an iPad. Our mind is running. And God is there. And we don't... He's gone from our heads. But He's there. He's everywhere. And the whole of His being God is God. He's imminent. He is personal. He's not just a vague being. He is personal. He has persons within him. That which says, I. He is personal because he has an intelligence. He has a will, and He reasons, and He speaks, and He fellowships, and He can be prayed to. Those are all activities of persons. God is personal. God has three persons. Now we're getting into the realm of that which is unsearchable for our heads. But just as we see ourselves as a being with a person, and we can look at other creatures of God and say they don't reason, they don't think, they don't have a will, they're creatures. But we are creatures that have persons because we were made in His image. So God is personal. He is beyond definition. He is spirit. He is personal. This may sound similar to the first. He is infinite, but it's a distinct thought. He is infinite. There is no way we can measure. Measure God as far as space is concerned. You can't throw out a line and, and count Him. And He is infinite in, in time. That means He's eternal, always has been, 
always will be, and he is infinite in ability. He can do everything he is pleased to want to do. He's infinite. That's what it means to be God. One last thought about the fact that God is, and that is this, that He is one. He is one in His being. He cannot be divided, and there's no conflict in the three persons with each other, and there's no conflict in any one of His virtues. We struggle. We struggle as a council, as a consistory rather. We struggle sometimes as a diaconate, and we struggle as parents. We got to be just. We have to punish. And yet, we got to be merciful. And whenever we work with them, sometimes it seems that the one goes in the bucket and the other dominates because it seems that they don't fit together. They, they mash. They conflict. God, all of his virtues, whether we get this or not, this is true. The Bible says so. Every single, well, here's the answer. God is every one of his virtues. So none of his virtues can conflict with each other because they're all Him. You possess virtues. You possess an intelligence. You possess a strength. You possess other attributes. God is every one of those virtues. He is strength. He is love. He is just. He is holy. Every single one of them. He is them. And they never, never conflict in him. He doesn't have to sacrifice one in order to do another. There's perfect harmony. That God is God. As such, he is. He always is. He unchangeably is. What we do Tuesday we're different on Friday. Same person, but we've been changing. So that I was, I will be, this is what I am. I can say I am now. But, but when, I, when I said it two, three seconds ago, I still am, but that, that was when I was. But in God, that's why Jehovah, I am. I am always everything in himself. Second, that God is good. That's an expression. That's a mantra. Say it over and over and over. God is is good. God is good to me. Always. He is good. Not better, not best. All you have to say is He is good. In the whole of His being, And that's why he is the object of his own focus. Sometimes we say it, he is the highest good. He is the object of his own focus. That's why he's the object of his glory. He is to be glorified and he alone. And he seeks his own glory because he is good. He's good inside himself. And he's good in all of his actions. And that's why he's good to me. Always. But he is good in himself. The highest good. All of his purposes, all of his desires are good. God is God. 
And one last thought. God is God. He is sovereign. He holds as old Reverend Heiss used to phrase the word sovereign to understand it, he has super reign. Sov reign. He has super reign. He governs. He controls everything in himself and everything outside of himself. Kim of North Korea. He's under control. The unbelievers in the other nations may say he's out of control. No, he's under control. Maybe not predictable to all others, but he's under control. Everything is under control. Nothing is outside of the control of God. He directs all things, and he's got a purpose in his control of all things. And his purpose goes back to the fact that he is good. His purpose is always his own glory, his own praise. All things are by him and for him and unto him. Romans 11. Now when as soon as you say that, then you just go down lower and lower, they're not for me. They're not unto me. They're unto Him. To Him be the glory, now and forever. And even His Son, Sue and I read that at the table this morning, 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty-eight. Even the Son, God put all things under Him, and then Paul writes it in such a way by inspiration, not that he who put all things under him is subject to him, but he controlled and gained control through, the, through his whole life of all things Jesus did so that he might put all things under him to have this phrase said, that God may be all in all. God. God is. What is idolatry that he forbids? Instead of or beside the one true God who has manifested it himself in his word to contrive of any other object. Well, there's two parts to that. And the first part is where every one of us has to stop and reflect. This brain can't get everything. I don't care how, how great its capacity to get things is, no human brain can get everything. No human brain can get everything in the right order and in the right balance and keep the right perspective of all things. I, I can think about mercy, but when I'm thinking about mercy, then I'm violating the right concept of justice and, and vice versa. There is the necessity given all the limitations that we must admit that belong to us, there is the constant necessity of going to the Scriptures. I don't need a Bible study a couple times a week. I need to have that Word in front of me all the time so that I constantly can keep a right knowledge, an accurate knowledge, the best understanding humanly possible for whatever my IQ is, whatever my faith is, I have to have the right understanding of the God who has revealed himself in his word. He is so above, we can't get anything of him. 
So when we start to get something of Him, it has to be because He has revealed Himself. And this revelation of Himself is the only accurate source. Because it's His revelation. So always, I've got to be going back to it to keep remembering. How many times don't we forget? Take a look at the first quote in the bulletin today. It's just a little hint of, of that difficulty of our retaining anything accurately for very long. The recognition that my heart is regenerated, but my mind is not. My mind can think correctly only when it's influenced by my heart. But by itself, the word total depravity fits every child of God's brain. And, and then you want to say, you got it? And you got it accurately? And you know? That's a fool. That's a fool. The truth is, I'm always needing correction. Oh yeah, and again, it's really easy sitting here to do that. And then you get a disagreement. What's the best time to start worship services at Grace Protestant Reformed Church? We constantly need to improve and correct our thinking by the Word of God so we don't distort. And it's not just the weakness of our own thinking. It's the recognition that what sin has done to me It's made me a lover of myself, covetous, boasters, proud. The word proud in the Greek is literally overbearing. Then it goes to disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. 2 Timothy 3 verse 2. And this is talking about the last times. Well, this is all time. So, you want to be conformed to the world or transformed by the renewing of your mind? Mr. Muhlenberg's favorite verse, passage. Verse 3. Here's how you be conformed to the world. You think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. That's conformed to the world. That's what they all do. They don't need faith to do that. We are not exercising faith. When we do that, think of ourselves more highly. You know we do it both ways. I think of myself more highly. I'm better than. But I'm also thinking of myself more highly when I, oh, I'm not as good as. Nobody cares about me. That's thinking about myself more often than I ought to think. That's world conformity. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that big idol, and that big idol is identified in the last part of 95, answer 95, I'm going to trust. I need some alcohol really to be happy. little weed. How about some nicotine? I trust it to take care, to give me what I need. Ibuprofen. I put my trust in a leave, in caffeine. A lesson that I learned long ago, and I hope I never forget it. Pastor at Hope Church, Christian Rest Home, old Mrs. Miedema. There she lay in her bed, all kinds of arthritis. Could only have medication to relieve the pain of her arthritis 
at certain hours. She'd be awake because it would wake her up, her pain, so she'd sing. And then she got her pills in the middle of the night. And she told me, I wouldn't take them without praying that God would use them. We pop them. She knew God had to use it. She put her trust in God to use. That's the right way to use medications. Not wrong to use medications. But ask Him to use them. Otherwise, we're trusting them. The Catechism lists sorcery, enchantment, superstitions, and invocation of saints. Sorcery, any kind of magic. Witchcraft. Enchantments. There's all kinds of fortune tellers down every street in a major city. Sometimes, sometimes obsessive compulsive. Got to do this and then it'll be okay. Not do that and it'll be okay. Superstitions. Invocation of saints. Calling on someone, praying to someone other than the one true God. Idolatry. What does he require? Right worship based on right knowledge. Right worship is worship His way. See, when God breathed into man, Adam, the breath of life, and we read Genesis 2, 7, man became a living soul, that expression, a living soul, means that, that Adam was able, unlike every other creature, to have a relationship with God. And every human, every human, every descendant of Adam has a living soul. Be careful with the word living, maybe, but he's got a soul. And that word soul means he can have a relationship with God. It is going to be negative or it's going to be positive. It's going to be a hating of him, a rejection of him, or it's going to be, uh, I rightly know him and I love him. But every human, because he's a living soul, is going to be able to have a relationship with God. So every human has a God. In addition, God created man. We call it friend-servant. Let's just emphasize that last part, servant. Every human is always serving something. If he's not serving God or an idol, he's serving himself. He's self-serving. We make something else our master, and we serve them. Right knowledge of this one, only, great, glorious, good God. Right understanding of Him will always... Make us say, Thou art worthy. Done. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy of my all. Thou art worthy of my trust. Thou art worthy of my play. Thou art worthy of my work. Thou art worthy of my thoughts. Thou art worthy of my eyesight. Thou art worthy of my brain activity. Thou art worthy of all. He's God. And we focus. And that right knowledge of Him is going to always say, He is worthy. I'm going to be devoted to Him. I'm going to trust Him. But again, the knowledge of our depravity affecting our brains, our minds, 
is that we're always going to go back to the scriptures. That's the beauty of that little song of the kids. The Bible tells me so. We cannot say that enough. The Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. The only, it's not my experience. It's not what I think. It's not my feelings. It's not what I think. It's what God says. That's how I'm going to learn rightly to know him. And it's the knowledge that we gain from his word that we exercise by faith. Faith knows, 11, Hebrews 11.6, knows he is. And he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We know him as our creator. We know him as our redeemer. We know him as my God. My Lord and my God. Monday, when we were brought from Valor to Chennai, we had some time, so they deliberately took us to a hill, the highest hill in Chennai, one of the large cities in India on the coast. And on the top of that hill is where they believe the disciple and the apostle Thomas came to witness and that's where he was martyred. So the Roman Catholic Church has a big shrine up there. It's very interesting. The name of the church is My Lord and My God. Well, that's what we say. He's God. He's my Lord. My Lord and my God. He is going to tell me how to live. He's going to tell me what attitude to have. And when my parents tell me what it should be, and I instinctively, because I've got a sanctified mind, a mind that is being influenced by my regenerated heart, no, maybe they're not giving me a verse, but they've got it from the Bible, then I don't know better. I can't take what I think. No, it's not even them, it's the Bible. It's God's word that's going to tell me about the right attitude I am to have about him. And what does he want from you? Take those three words in the catechism. Love, fear, glorify him. Love him, love him. First and great commandment, love him. Do we know what it means to love? Really? Not just emotions. It's knowledge. We know him to be great. We know him to be good. We know him to be God. There's no other word. That, remember the word El, Elohim? That God who is filled with every perfection, infinitely and eternally and immeasurably. That God. Right worship is constantly striving to do what he wants me to do. I want to do what he wants me to do. Not what somebody else, not what my boyfriend, not what my girlfriend, what he wants me to do. Right worship is I want to do whatever he commands me to do. Two, I'm going to trust him, trust him, trust him. Trust is knowing his ability to keep every single one of his promises. Even when it's the darkest it could ever be. Even when it hurts horribly. I'm going to trust him to keep his promises. Right worship is I will bow. Why do we promise to submit to church government? Because we are submitting to God. And in our submitting to him... We say, he's right, and I must exercise myself in humility and in biblical patience, clinging to him. And I don't expect good things from my parents. I expect all good things from him. It's not what my parents or grandma and grandpa can give me under the Christmas tree. It's I expect all things, good things from him and from him only. Finally this. Go back to Isaiah. 
the worship of other gods results in a horrible condition. They that make them are like unto them, the psalmist says in Psalm 115, verse 8. Verses 18 and through 20, They have not known nor understood. He hath shut their eyes. They cannot see in their hearts that they cannot understand. In India, you're surrounded. And then to realize they cannot see. They cannot understand. Neither is there knowledge nor understanding to realize I burned part of this in the fire to keep me warm. I burned part of this in a fire to make bread and roast meat. And I take another part of it and I make it a god and I bow down to it. But they can't see what they're doing. They don't realize it. Because they're not been given faith to have their spiritual eyes opened. You have. You know God is. That's why it's so bad when we forget Him. It's almost like I could say of they can't help it. But you and I can. But then he tells us one other thing. Praise the Lord. I take all the times you can't and you don't. And I forgive him. I've blotted out like the thick clouds will hide the sun. I, I, I've taken it away. What a God. He is worthy. So worthy. Amen. Our Father... Thanks, so that we may know that while we only know a little, we know Thee, we know Thy promises, and Thou wilt keep us. And it's not because we're good enough, it's because Thy mercy faileth never. Thou wilt not leave us. Thou art here, seeing everything, but also Thou art here, holding our hand to keep us near Thy side. We love Thee, not as much as we should, not even with a perfect love, but we love Thee with a beginning. Small, but it's a beginning because Thou hast worked it in us by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And there again, we thank Thee. For Jesus' sake, Amen.